Welcome back. This is the Uptime Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. I'm joined here uh, remotely by lightning protection expert, Alan Hall. Alan, how are you? Great, Dan. How are you doing? I'm good, actually. Well, I had my, uh, I don't know if my pride was damaged the other day, but I made two separate trips to the grocery store, to two separate grocery stores. Whoa. I got got turned away both times. The people at the front door turned you away? The security wouldn't let me in. Do you know why? No mask. No mask. I didn't have a mask on. Yep. Is that is that the law of the land down in Washington D.C. right now? I was asking myself that same question because I was like, well, how how was I supposed to know this? I mean, obviously, I like I I walk. It was a ten minute walk to the first one, and then yeah, um, a farther walk to the next one later in the day. But I don't know how. I don't know it was an official decree. It sounds like maybe it is. I don't know. Well, there'd be no one more tuned into social media than you, so I'm surprised that you didn't know that. Well, I, I do follow uh, Mayor Bowser here in D.C., and they've been doing a really good job, and, and the incidences yeah. are still pretty low here in D.C. Yeah, they are. And I appreciate that they're doing that. It's like I couldn't really be mad. Like, obviously, I was irritated because I just, like, wasted basically a 25-minute round trip. <laughs> right. But beyond that, it's like you can't be mad at them. Like, it's no. like, all right, I got to go make a mask. And then I made a mask. And it was just a terrible experience as I went through the grocery store because I cut up a T-shirt, I duct taped the ends together of this strip of fabric, <laughs> you know, and then threw it over my head like a headband, and it just yep. would not stay up. I was like, "Oh, this will work fine," and it did not work fine. So I was just going through the grocery store, huh. struggling to keep this above my nose the whole time, and uh, just getting really frustrated by it. But I, I guess you haven't I'm seen here. the. Well, have you seen the little online? I, I think I saw it on YouTube about how to make your own mask with the two rubber bands and the paper towel. Yeah, I got to get in the grocery store first to buy rubber bands. <laughs> I, catch, I can mail you 22. some rubber bands. <laughs> you know, chicken, chicken before the mask thing here. So. Well, maybe, maybe we can go to the store and buy a couple masks and put it in the mail and get it to over to you so you can go to the grocery store. Are you getting mail? Is uh, a mail person coming to the to your complex there or what? Yeah, yeah. I actually got a I got a new plant uh, featured in the background um, of the, the the video frame here. That's a mail order plant. Mail order plant. I got a oh, real. Go. It's one of those. I'm sure you've seen them everywhere. It's like a good indoor plant. It's called a snake plant. It's got those kind of yeah. like wide leaves, and yeah. apparently you can just like abuse them and they keep on going. But yeah. I'm taking great care of the little guy. But uh, filter my air out a little bit, you know. Just have a companion. <laughs> That's your coronavirus Bounce. filter. Yeah, he's my buddy. Just bounce <laughs> thoughts off him. Just. You know, okay. I, yeah. So, but no, I mean, yeah. all that stuff's still going. I try not to go to the post office because there's, re- there's a really tight, it's like a, it's like three phone booths combined is the size of my post office five blocks away. And wow, it's not great to sit in there. They're not usually the most efficient places. So is it a, an original post office from George Washington time or just <laughs> what, what's yeah, going on? I mean, we live in the middle of nowhere and our, our post office is one empty and two much larger than that. So. It is a quirky hmm. size space. It's not a small, like, it is a standalone building. It's not that small. Like, it strikes me as the size of, like, a standalone McDonald's almost, but the actual waiting room is really <laughs> tiny, like, super small. Huh. So wow. a lot of people well, just wait outside, but then... That's why you need your mask. Yeah. Right? Exactly, but I need to get in the grocery store first to get my rubber bands. <laughs> <laughs> so It's the yeah. proverbial catch-22, yes. Yes, indeed. Huh. So this week, uh, we're talking a little bit about um, one of Applied Philosophy's uh, lightning protection systems. So they have a, a pretty unique one that's a, kind of like a kit add-on to a bunch of different Gamisa turbine models. Um, so Alan, why does this, uh, this SLPS system, why, did that, why does that need to exist is my, my first question. Because it seems like good technology, but yeah. what, what's the problem that they're solving is my question. Uh, so what it is is a basically an electrical connection device as the blades rotate around on the turbine uh, they can build up static electricity or they can just from air friction or you know, if there's an electrified thunderstorm cloud nearby the blades will get charged so um, there's there's charge in those blades and as they kind of sweep by the nacelle they can occasionally discharge to the nacelle and Gamesa has actually installed a device to uh, bridge that gap what applied philosophy has done is they've made a better connection there so they're actually physically connecting to the blade and to the nacelle to reduce um, sparking between the two Uh, and the 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 thought behind it is sparking 
causes electrical noise. Electrical noise causes uh, 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 transients in the wiring inside the nacelle. So sensitive electronics inside the nacelle that's controlling the the whole generator system and all the monitoring equipment can get upset from those sparks that are are generated as the blade spins around. So uh, the applied philosophy basically bridges that gap. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, so static electricity, how big of a, of a hazard is that? I mean, we talk about big. lightning, but how big is a hazard, of a hazard is it? And what are the main threats that it pose? Because much, it's going to be a bunch of lower you know, voltage and amperage and all that stuff. So why is it so uh, um, problematic? It's like a capacitor uh, in, a, in a sense. You, you got one of the world's largest capacitors <laughs> in a blade. You got this. You got this metal down conductor inside of it, and you have all this plastic on the outside, and uh, all that can get charged. And it would be enough to seriously hurt you, I think, it, on the right day in the right conditions. It would mm-hmm. hurt a human. I, I don't know. Have you ever seen? Uh, oh my gosh, what's what's the submarine? The Tom Clancy submarine movie. Red October. Huh? Red, Red October. October. Right. Remember in Red October where they're trying to to lower uh, Alec Baldwin's uh, character down onto the to the submarine. I don't remember any of this, but I'm gonna what? nod my head and say yes. Oh my I, gosh, yes, I do. I remember Sean Connery's in it, but that's all I remember. Well, yeah, but okay. So Sean Connery plays the Soviet uh, submarine pilot captain, and then Alec Baldwin plays the the you know, renegade American, right? So okay, uh, they're lowering Alec Baldwin down onto the submarine in the middle of the ocean, and, they, and he's do, he's in a helicopter, and the helicopter is generating a lot of static electricity from the blades rolling rolling around. In the, in the rainstorm. And as they lower him down, uh, one of the crewmen on the submarine tries to reach up and grab Alec Baldwin's character and gets shocked uh, wow. and gets knocked unconscious. And that, and that is actually a, a real situation because the helicopter, because the blades are moving so fast, can generate a lot of static electricity. And as a helicopter gets closer to the, to the earth, they usually drop a line down to discharge it. Right? And, and the ground crew has a, a huh. stick they use to discharge it. Uh, if you don't, it's going to go through the person, and it really hurts. Uh, there's actually a study done uh, several years ago. I have to go pull that back up now, but there was a study about how painful uh, those discharges were. I think it was a Soviet study, actually, where they actually uh, put someone down there and like, okay, tell us how much this hurts. <laughs> and, that seems nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it gives you a real answer, I suppose. First, first-hand uh, knowledge of shock, shock damage, but... Uh, that same thing exists on a wind turbine where you have, it's not obviously not a wind turbine blade. It's not moving as fast as a helicopter blade, but it's moving a lot more air. And as you get that charge build up on it, it's going to discharge at some point. And if you happen to be working on it at the time, you're going to get really walled up. And that's why in, in the case of wind turbines, when they stop them, they want to discharge everything before they start uh, playing around in the blades. Uh, so the applied philosophy uh, concept is really good, uh, which is essentially let's eliminate some of that static electricity every time the blade comes around to top dead center. It it discharges the blade, so it doesn't really build up a lot of charge before and it, 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 where it can really hurt you or create a big electrical spark, which creates a bunch of noise, which and then turns on a lot of alarms because all the sensitive electronics in the cell go hay, go haywire. So, so it's a, it's a good concept. Yeah, help me out here. So I know if I in, in my socks and I'm five years old and I'm like yep. running around the, uh, my, you know, my carpeted living room, yep. I'm going to generate static electricity. How yep. do you generate static electricity when you're just rotor blades in the air? Uh, you got a piece of plastic blades, plastic, and you're, you're running it through the air and it's a bunch of molecules you run it into. Uh, you tend to see more on it. I'll, I'll give you the airplane example because I think it also applies here, which is, uh, we call it precipitation static a lot of times on aircraft. When aircraft gets charged, aircraft don't get charged all that much in clear air, and, and wind turbine blades also won't. So there's like really two kinds of charging that happen here. One is, is you're running into uh, ice, frozen water. So there's okay. a friction there. So as a blade hits these little ice particles, uh, helicopter blade, airplane, wind turbine blade, uh, it knocks off electrons, and then those electrons... Um, basically transfer from and these are how big where are these particles and how big are they they're in a cloud Uh, they tend to be small yeah in in clouds right so it's not like hail in a sense like uh, as we sit on it's in clouds so if there's any clouds around the wind turbines and a lot of these wind turbines are up at elevation 
uh, and they are in clouds, and there's if any of that precipitation is freezing or close to freezing, it can transfer charge from the water molecules over to the blade. Hmm. Okay. So it's it's actually frictional charging, just like you rubbing your socks on the on the carpet. It's a friction charger because you're actually running into something that's hard. Rain doesn't do that as much. It can build up a little bit of a charge, uh, but because water is pliable when it's liquid state, it doesn't really transfer uh, electrons from one thing to another. So when it's frozen, though, that's a a different thing, and it does transfer a lot of charge. That's why you see on aircraft, uh, I had the fortunate or unfortunate experience of flying what we call precipitation static flights, which is essentially looking for places where you can charge the aircraft up a lot. Uh, And we did a bunch of testing uh, this is when I worked at Beach Aircraft, and uh, when you fly through rain, the aircraft doesn't really get charged. When you fly through ice, it gets charged quickly and to mm-hmm. very high levels almost immediately. So the same thing is this on wind turbines. And I know um, around us in western Massachusetts, there's a, wind turbines tend to be at the top of mountain peaks. There's a lot of times like today where it was snowing out, uh, when, this, when, it's in, when the blades are impacting snow, they're totally getting charged up. A lot. Uh, anytime you're flying through snow crystals, uh, those obviously it's it's another form of ice crystals. Uh, you're going to build up charge on that blade. It's going to be a lot of charge. So you got to be really careful when you're around those things. And the, and the second way you build up charge on a blade is just because of the thunderstorm around. Uh, so there's a there's a strong electromagnetic a strong electric field from the the charge in the cloud, and so the the blade gets polarized and a bunch of charge on it. Uh, if if the cloud above it discharges, then all that charge that had built up in the blade's got to go somewhere, and it's going to go back down to earth typically. So that if you happen to be around that, it's going to snap and hiss. And the, if you look at the Applied Philosophy, it has a couple of pretty decent YouTube videos. Uh, they explain that process like, hey, uh, when it's cloudy outside, there's a lot of static electricity in the air, you're getting upsets on your monitoring system, and it's costing you... Uh, thousands of dollars a year to go out there and reset all those things because the blade stops turning and you're not creating power. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yep. So for the other non-electrical engineers out there, including yeah. myself, where does so you talk about things charging, right? And obviously, yeah. all of us as kids did that same thing. Like you walk around in your socks on Saturday morning after eating your, <laughs> you know, your yeah. crazy sugar sugary cereal and running around the house, wired and, up. Yep. fighting with your brothers and sisters, you know, yep. you, you go and touch the doorknob and you see that spark jump from your fingers. But yep. so I, I get the concept of charging. I know that I mm-hmm. never felt electricity in my body, um, like with a turbine or a, an airplane, when you say it's getting charged up, where is that, where are those electrons stored? Like where is the, is it staying in the airplane skin? Is it in the wind turbine in the blade itself? Or is it hovering on the outside? Like where, when you, when you say that conceptually, uh, where yeah. is it? Uh, it's the least energy state. It's, let's just start there. So if you charge, a, let's do the real simple experiment uh, where you take a, a, a balloon and you inflate it and you rub it on your head and then it charges up your hair and it charges up a balloon. Mm-hmm. So charge doesn't really migrate on plastic parts very well. So whatever the, wherever the charge started is kind of where it's going to stay. So wherever you rub the balloon is where that charge is going to stay. On metal objects, uh it's going to go to a least energy state, which means if you charge up a, a metal airplane or or a, a down conductor, for that matter, uh, the, if you put a bunch of extra charge on it, the charge is going to try to get away from itself, right? So like charges do not attract, right? They repel one another. So you're putting a bunch of like charges, a bunch of essentially negative charge on on uh, on an airplane, for example, or a down conductor. So the charge is going to get as far away from itself as it possibly can to a least energy state, which is on an airplane out towards the perimeters and on a wind turbine it's going to be somewhere around the, the on the tips of the down conductor at the, the bottom end of the top end it's going to, going to try to spread itself out so that it, there's no concentration to charge necessarily um so that's that's where your trouble lies is um on a on a blade you got two problems one you got the down conductor probably charged because it doesn't have a ground path except uh through this uh, applied philosophy device Mm-hmm. And then the, the second one is the the surface of the blade itself can get charged, and that charge doesn't move very well. So the it's very similar. I'll give you another airplane example, which was the Beach Starship, which was a carbon fiber airplane, one of the first 
real commercially available carbon fiber airplane. And one of the <laughs> one of the uh, things that they noticed off that airplane was when you flew it through icing conditions, static electricity types of conditions, when they brought it back down to earth, that that thing would hold a charge. And you could walk up to it a half hour later and touch it and get walloped mm-hmm. uh, because the charge doesn't migrate very well. The airplane is kind of carbon fiber plasticky thing, so there's a lot of plastic in it, and the charge took a long time to migrate. Same thing happens on the wind turbine blades. It's mostly balsa wood and fiberglass and plastics. Uh, charge doesn't migrate very well, but if you happen to touch the wrong spot of it, whammo, <laughs> you're going gotcha. to get lit up. They'd be similar to touching a, a windscreen on an airplane, which, like on Boeing and Airbus airplanes, there's no anti-static coatings on there. There's straight glass, essentially. Um, and if you go on YouTube and look at St. Elmo's Fire on a, on a airplane window, you'll see these big, big discharges happen. That's electrical charge going trying to even itself out on the airplane and over that windscreen which is non-conductive if you if you touch that window after you've been through a flight like that it will shock you and it will hurt uh and the same thing will exist on wind turbine blades and and probably in parts of the nacelle quite honestly i know the times i've been up on a nacelle uh but this is down times i remember are are in west texas when we went up onto a couple of nacelles in in west texas and looking at some blades uh, one of the things we did was really try to reach over and discharge stuff before we got up in there just because it would hold enough charge, it would hurt, and mm-hmm. it's no fun. <laughs> even you know, even if you're walking walking along the carpet and you're rubbing your, your socks on the carpet, you're touching the doorknob, that hurts, but multiply that times about 1,000, <laughs> and yeah. that's the kind of shock you're going to get. Yeah, gotcha. dangerous. So the effects of static, oh, static electricity, aside from gapping, does yeah. that— and does that expedite the? Uh, is that a word? Expedite? I think it is. Is that expedite? Is that, expedite? Is that speed up the uh, <laughs> the process? Because we've talked about uh, the blades dielectric becoming more porous over time. Does yeah. does static electricity hasten that process? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. If you build up enough static electricity on anything, um, air plastic aircraft parts get you see it all the time. They become porous over time because you, you end up putting so much charge on them. It's going to find a home eventually mm-hmm. and it'll, it'll pinprick uh, the plastic. I think the same thing is this on wind turbines. I don't think it's is because wind turbines are so much bigger. It's hard to pick out little tiny details like that, but you see it all the time on airplane parts all the time. Uh, particularly on nose radomes, you'll see it all the time. You see these little uh, static little black discharge spots, marks. Yeah. yeah black like spots and wink. Yeah. Turned off. Yep. Yep, you see them all the time. All the t- basically any any corner of an airplane, wingtip, ailerons, um, elevators, vertical stabs. Yeah, you're going to see these these burn marks that happen from that. Yeah, uh, and it's it's not trivial. Uh, I think a lot of us think static charge is a trivial thing. It is totally not a trivial thing. It's a big nuisance item for wind turbines. Obviously, if you start uh, tripping off a lot of alarms on the wind turbine and the turbine shuts down because it's not sure what it's doing, you're losing money. That's crazy. There's no reason to be losing, losing money there. Uh, and on an airplane, it just causes havoc to the mostly the radio system, so you, you, it makes it hard to communicate or navigate. Both of those are bad, and, and that's why we spend so much time uh, on the aircraft side, on the aerospace side, we spend so much time, and there's actually regulations that say you got to go look at this and make sure the aircraft's safe to go fly. On the wind turbine side, not so much. And I think that's just mm-hmm. an experience thing. As we continue to push the envelope and we continue to push more and more wind turbines out into places like the North Sea or off the coast of Japan and worse weather conditions like snowy conditions, <laughs> like yeah. where, we're, where we're used a lot in the west uh, coast of Japan for strike tape, the static electricity there is going to be tremendous because the blades are always turning in snow. And I think the same thing exists in the North Sea where a lot of times they're turning in snow or on the hills, on the mountains of Italy where they're always turning in snow. There's a lot of static there. And so the, the SLPS device that Applied Philosophy has come up with makes complete sense in that you're constantly discharging you're, you know you are because you're making physical contact between the blade and the cell. You're providing an electrical path for that charge to travel wherever it's going to travel every every rotation. So mm-hmm. there's just very little chance you're going to build up a lot of charge on the blade. And the little sparks that develop, that happen between the blade, uh, the the applied philosophy device, and then the cell will be much, much smaller versus the several inches uh, of arcing that would occur otherwise. 
So electrical noise is related to the length of the spark for the most part because the voltages are higher. So the higher the voltage, the higher the noise. And it's just like a lightning strike in the middle of the summertime. You hear it on your AM radio. Same sort of thing. Big, big, long arc creates a lot of noise that will travel across the world. Same thing exists here where, in this case, the sparks are really close to the sensitive electronics or within feet. So that's, that's why the apply philosophy device makes sense. And you, you did look at those. You had a chance to look at those videos online when they're doing the high current test, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they did testing down at, uh, from what I could see on the one video, they had clearly been down to uh, Lightning Technologies or NTS down at Pittsfield and had done 200,000 amp uh, high current test across that device. That was pretty impressive. Uh, uh, can we put that as part of the show notes, Dan, is, is the yeah, little YouTube sure. video? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that would be good because you can actually see how that lightning test was conducted. They, 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 have, they have done their homework. Uh, you got to give them credit. Uh, they have done their homework, and it sounds like they're selling some of these things, which is good because nuisance failures on wind turbines are costly. Yeah. So let's talk about um, one of the other small... Uh, often misunderstood and just overlooked pieces of lighting protection, which is what WeatherGuard sells. So um, how does a, a segmented lightning diverter like strike tape, how does that help discharge some of that static electricity? Well, it, in, in our case, uh, strike tape is used around the receptors, and it's there to guide the lightning and static electricity to and from the receptor. Uh, because in, in many cases, and it's very easy to see, go online and just Google lightning receptor or wind turbine blade. Uh, you'll see a, a, a bunch of lightning damage and static electricity damage up around the receptors because you're not moving charge to where it should go, which is where the receptor is. And so our strike tape device actually provides the pathway to and from the receptor. So on the lightning strike situation, uh, a lot of times the receptors are actually reaching out electrically into the space. We're providing that pathway to get off the blade. So it follows the strike tape, goes out in the atmosphere, and then if the discharge happens, the discharge happens. But we know we've already created that pathway. Same thing for static electricity. Uh, what you don't want to do on a blade is let random static electricity discharges just happen any place. Yeah. You want to control where that happens, right? So in the strike tape case, near the receptor, it's going to take that. St- if the blade does get charged, it's trying to discharge up in the atmosphere, and it will do that at least you're giving it a path to go, and it's not through the blade. It's on the outside of the blade where it can do no structural damage. That's the beauty of something like a strike tape because you can just apply right to the outside of the, of the wind turbine blade and get that kind of increase in performance and protection against punctures around and, and, and electrical stress around the receptor. It extends the life of the blade considerably just for that reason. Gotcha, gotcha. So... Let's talk a little bit about the the error codes that you alluded to. So, yeah, what are some of these error codes, and so they get tripped by not just lightning strikes, but just any amount of current flowing through the tower, through the nacelle, through the blades. I mean, what trips yeah, those, so, those error codes? So think think of it this way: uh, a lot of the instrumentation on a turbine blade, the monitoring systems are there, and they're working at roughly five volts, maybe ten volts, twenty volts, right? So they're actually uh, they're sensing things. Uh, let's just use one e- simple example. So let's just use the anemometer, which is a, a wind speed sensor. That thing operates at a relatively low voltage, and a lot of times the wires aren't shielded there. So you're, you're trying to measure wind speed. It's sitting there spinning around, and it's measuring data, and that tells you how you're positioning the blades to get the most efficient use of the wind turbine to generate power, right? So using mm-hmm. the, the wind speeds, and you can actually pivot the, the blades for more efficiency. So what happens is that spark that happens between the blade and then the cell as it arcs across uh, is a, it's getting coupled into the wiring, uh, like the anemometer wiring. And so the computer that's sitting on the backside that's working at a couple of volts sees this 100 or 200 volt spike happen. And doesn't know what to do with it. it. It just barfs at it, and it says, whoa, something is really wrong. I've over-limited. That's not possible. In those cases, I, basically, I, I have a bad atomometer, so I'm going to stop measuring wind speed. And when I stop measuring wind speed, I probably stop the turbine because I don't know what I'm doing. It's just like yeah. also not knowing where the wind direction is. So, you know, it's you, some of your worst-case situations, the wind turbine's pointing in the wrong direction 
or and, and or take that back even on an anemometer where you if the wind speeds are too high you're not sensing it you don't want to be running the wind turbine you want to stop it right so not having a working anemometer a lot of times will just shut down the turbine and that's that's where that electrical noise plays into it because it's working at a couple of volts and then it sees this big voltage spike or repeated big voltage spike because every time that blade comes around or those three blades come around it gets spark 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 it just wipes out the sense it just overwhelms the signal which is trying to measure so it would be um sort of like if you're trying to have a conversation at a rock concert mm-hmm. sort of like that you'd be standing right next to somebody having the conversation at, at, a, at a human level but there's just so much noise in the background, you can't hear one another. That's what it's like in electronics. Gotcha. And then are repairmen dispatched for all these? I mean, do they have to have someone physically go out to reset them? Yeah. To reset a them lot of times, yeah. Yeah, because the, the, hard, the hard failures, they have to take someone to physically look at. Because what you don't want to do is start it back up and have some... It, if it did shut down because there was a, a real significant problem, you just don't want to like flip it, flip it back on and not go look yeah, at it right just destroy itself or something you, right because yeah. right because it's 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 the proverbial uh the circuit breaker blue let me reset the circuit breaker oh but blue again let me reset it again and then there's a fire yeah that's you this figure is out a, why. The, right you want to figure out why before you turn it back on i because you have to take every fault as a real condition now it's sort of like uh crying wolf right if you have a constant and I think this is one of the solutions that Applied Philosophy is trying to, to, to address, which is um, as the repair guys or repair people go back out uh, to these wind turbines and are constantly resetting the same error code all the time, they stop looking if there's a real problem. Yeah. So it's human you, nature. You just like you yeah, said, cry right. wolf. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna get to the point where you, you're gonna uh, just start flicking the system on and not paying attention to what's going on, and that's when dangerous things can happen right so you're by eliminating those false codes from happening you actually make it a much safer environment for everybody yeah no that that makes sense yeah i I can imagine i know me working on cars as a as a high schooler and a little bit into college like you start to learn that all right i just i don't want to just address the symptom like i want to make sure i know what the problem was so right you know if you have a little whether it's electrical <laughs> or some other little thing that's like a yeah. parts wearing out before it should you're like okay well why is this happening there's got to be something else happening? else going on yeah rather than just you know throwing a new like you said a new flipping the circuit or throwing a new fuse in there or yeah. throwing a new brake pads even though they're wearing out super fast or whatever it might be yeah so, or the, or the putting the penny in the fuse box to Mm. taking the fuse out altogether, right? How many times have you seen that in a car? I've seen it more than enough times. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Those systems are there to prevent you from getting killed, and then you short-circuit those systems, and, and then bad stuff happens. Don't do that, right? And, and, why, and why do we call that gremlins? And is, that a, is that a United States thing where we call it a gremlin? Uh, it may I be. I don't know. It may be. I kind of wonder what they call it in other countries, but, uh, yeah, here we always say, oh, it's another gremlin, right? And a gremlin was, a, was a, a car at one point, which is just a weird choice to name a car, obviously. It was an ugly car, so it was a, maybe a fair choice. <laughs> so I mean, a, was it appropriate? It ad- adequately described its uh, <laughs> physical attractiveness, yeah. I was just walk into the dealership, yeah, I like one of those gremlins, please. Yeah, I mean, it was no swan. It was no, you know, I don't know what a <laughs> majestic animal. No eagle, no, no. tiger, lion. It wasn't whatever. a Mustang. Let's just call it that. It was not yeah, a Mustang. Yeah. For right. sure, for sure. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so, so they're a company that's, that's, but they're not, they're not manufacturing that SLPS system for like that many models. It's only, it seems like a select handful of, of Siemens Gamisa yeah. turbines. So yeah. it seems like maybe that's just, it's not an issue with other, other wind turbine models. I think that it is. They have very similar setups, uh, but the, on the Gamesa model, they have a very a specific, uh, arrangement in which uh, applied philosophy can just retrofit onto so you don't have mm-hmm. to do a lot of mods to and you don't want to do gotcha. a lot of mods to the wind turbine you want to be able to just take what's there improve it and and which is what they've done they've taken the existing architecture and mechanical interface and just grafted onto it with something that works electrically better yeah so gotcha. it's a it's, it's a smart device gotcha well it's cool there's a lot of uh, pretty interesting technology we talked a little bit about drones yeah. and and some of the video stuff, and there's a, there's a handful of other companies that are doing that stuff as well. So it's interesting seeing some of these just startups and and other ventures that are trying to make because because it, it just makes sense that 
I mean, these are so far out in remote corners of the world that yeah. you just don't want to be sending humans out there all the time. It's like, all right, get in your get in your plane and then get in a weird like you know. I imagine like a you know in The <laughs> Shining where they have that like snow cat that has to yes. get out to the hotel. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you're taking that out to get to some of these things. I know they have roads built in there, but how do you know The Shining but not Red October? I don't have you. Have you seen The Shining a, but not Red October? They're like a, ten years fair, apart. That is what? a fair. That is a fair question. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> and you have downtime right now, so you can actually sit there and watch Red October, which is a very good movie, by the way. I have no downtime. I have no downtime. People think <laughs> I have downtime, but I have many, many, <laughs> many projects, and uh, I don't know. As much as I do appreciate classic movies, I don't know. That one just was like. Too that's a much. classic. I don't know. It just didn't appeal. I remember it. My brother was into it, but because it's based just, in in Washington D.C., a whole a whole section of that movie is based in Washington D.C., just down the road from you. Matter of fact, this is true. This is true. All right, you can probably we'll to, see some things you would recognize it. out your window. You probably you probably been to a lot of these places. Well, people have been hounding me to watch Tiger King, not so much The Hunt for well, October, uh, which I'm gonna stay um, agnostic on tiger king i don't know i have that. even i don't even know i know what it is i don't have no idea what it's about it's, so I it's hope just to like a baffling way. weird um i don't know it's a, it's a strange strange show but um but yeah so alan good show today appreciate it um, yeah thanks dan like you said there's a lot of new new technology and i think we're going to continue to cover some of these interesting innovations and some of the companies that are behind them um, i think it's a it's a worthwhile talking point for a lot of these shows and we have a bunch more coming up so yeah um, if you're new to the, uh, to the podcast, thanks for tuning in. We're on iTunes, Spotify, all your, pa- your podcast platforms. We're on YouTube. So if you want to check out the video version, if you're not currently watching the video version, definitely jump over to YouTube. We also have short clips. So if you're looking for a specific piece of information, um, check out our clips from, uh, the Uptime podcast, uh, can jump right to where, you know, you're looking for, if we have a, a snippet that can, that can help you. So, and lastly, definitely subscribe to the channel, find us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Facebook, we're everywhere, so everywhere you want to be, depending on your age. So if you're young, maybe it's Instagram. If you're a little older, maybe it's uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever it is, we're out there. So thanks again for tuning in, and we will see you here next week.